I'd like to welcome each one of you to our devotional study today. I invite you to take your Bible and join me in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Today we are going to read verses 11 through 16, which talk about the duties of the man of God. And uh, then we will work our way down through this passage. So 1 Timothy 6, and beginning in read in verse 11, it says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So as we come into these verses, we see several things regarding the duties of the man of God. First of all, we see that he is to flee the above. Um, that is when he says, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. You say, well, what are the things that he is to be fleeing from? Well, in order to find that out, you simply go back um, to verses 6 through 10. And there we see the... Uh, idea of godliness with contentment is great gain and we saw the whole idea of possessions are only temporary and that we are to be satisfied with the necessities of life and we saw in verses 9 and 10 the danger of materialism so he's reminding us of the idea of fleeing from riches fleeing from materialism not trying to find our fulfillment in those things but rather than following uh, riches on this earth, he encourages them to follow the true riches. It says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. So we see there that he is to um, follow these true riches. He is to follow after the true riches that are spiritual. Um, follow after righteousness. That's the idea of the righteousness that only God can give. And not only that, but also that righteousness speaks of the outward behavior that we have toward God and men. And that outward behavior, which is proper, is a result of the righteousness of God that we have been cleansed in. And then he also says, not only follow righteousness, but follow godliness. That is, follow anything that is like God, anything that would draw us closer to God. Follow faith. That is the idea of us having a confident trust in God, uh, not just for our soul's salvation, but for our day-to-day -day living. That we don't have to wring our hands, we don't have to worry. We've got that confidence in God, that God is going to take care of us as we serve Him. Then it says, follow after love. And that's, just, that's not talking about the love that this world looks at today. As a matter of fact, much of what the world thinks of, of love is really lust. And uh, But rather what we see here is that love that comes from God, that love that is genuine, that love that is not selfish, that love that is sacrificial. And then also we are to follow patience, um, you know, that we are to have patience toward other people, that we are to have patience in our service to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we are to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And then also that we are to follow meekness. Now, meekness is not weakness. Meekness, very simply, is strength under control. Uh, if you want to look at an example of meekness, obviously the one that we think of in the Word of God is the example of Moses. And then we see that we are to fight the good fight of faith in verse 11. Fight the good fight of faith. Uh, you know, that carries with it the idea of of understanding, as I've said before already in this study of First Timothy, the Christian life is not a playground; it is a battlefield. And uh, if we are, we need people in this day and age that will stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, that will stand for that which is right, that will stand for what the Word of God teaches. We are living in a day where to do that could very well mean that you will be mocked. Uh, but that does not matter. What matters is that we must stand for that which is right. And then not only fight the good fight of faith, but also to lay hold on the prize and to continue his profession. It says, fight the good fight of faith 
lay hold on eternal life, uh, whereunto thou art also call, called and hast professed a good profession among many witnesses. So he reminds us there that we are to uh, understand that he has called us to a life that is deeper than just a physical life here on this earth, that he has called us to eternal life, and that we are what we are to really grasp, what we are to really take a hold of, is that life which is eternal. In other words, live for the eternal. Don't just simply live for the temporal. Don't live for the here and now, as has been challenged earlier in this chapter, but live for that which is eternal. Live for that which will be gold, silver, and precious stone, or precious stones when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't serve and don't spend and invest your life on that which is wood, hay, and stubble, but that which will last in eternity and that which shows the reality of the profession that you make, that the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. May that be lived out in your life. May it be fleshed out in the way that you live your life, and may it be evident toward those around you. And then we see that he is charged in the sight of God and the witnessing of Christ, which means that Christ is our example. Notice in verse 13, he says, I give thee charge. In other words, I command you this in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things. Now, the word quickeneth simply means that he gives life to all things, that he is the one that is giving us spiritual life, that he is the one who gives life abundant and free, that he is the one who gives purpose. And then he says also in that verse, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. In the same way that Christ witnessed a good confession in his life, we are to witness that kind. That is the kind of life that we are to live as a people of God. And then he is charged to maintain and to pass on the truth in verse 14, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, nogus until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when he talks about the commandment there, he's talking about the truth of the word of God. He's talking about holding fast to the truth of the word of God until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, as I think about that, I'm reminded of 1 John chapter 2, what John says there in verse 28, where he says these words, he says, uh, and now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him and his coming. What a blessing it is to be able to face God with confidence, knowing that we have served him in the power and the enabling of the Holy Spirit of God, and we've allowed him to be at work in and through us, and that we are not ashamed before him and his coming. And then we see in verses 15 and 16, it says, you know, it talks about this uh, this sublime description of our Lord here. It says, Who in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen, neither can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So first of all, we are reminded that Christ is the one who is the absolute ruler. It says, Who in his times he will show, who is a blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You know, as I was thinking about him being the absolute ruler, friends, it does us well today to remember that he is the one who is in control. And uh, that when it is all said and done, that we will understand that he is the one who is victorious. Revelation 17 and verse 14 says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Then in Revelation 19, verse 16, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse. Or sorry, 1916. And he hath on his vesture and on his name, on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And friends, he is the one who is victorious. Then as we come back into First uh, Timothy 6 and verse 16, we see that he is immortal. It says, who only hath immortality. In other words, he is the only one who is immortal. He is the only one who will never die. He's the only one who never changes. And then he dwells in unapproachable splendor. It says here, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. Oh, friends, I wish we had time to look at that today. But I encourage you, jot these verses down as we think about this unapproachable splendor. Psalm 104 and verse 2. And uh, also, Revelation chapter 21, verse 11, verse 23, and verse 24. 
and Revelation 22 5 all talk about the splendor of our God and then this verse concludes to say who, who to whom everlasting honor and power are ascribed who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto whom no man has seen nor can see to whom be honor and power everlasting friends he is the only one that for everlastingly honor and power belongs unto him let's give him the honor Let's do his name. Have a great day.